The Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and your local cable provider presents Cable Reports. Join us now as Cable Reports brings you up to date on current issues facing the Commonwealth through discussions with your local legislators and other policymakers from across Virginia. From the General Assembly and the City of Richmond, I'm Woody Evans for Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and Comcast, connecting Virginians to their government. We're pleased to have two members of the House of Delegates and a state senator with us this morning, Delegate Riley Ingram. Good to see you, sir. Woody, it's nice to be here. Nice to see you. And a new senator, Siobhan Donovan. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks for having me, Woody. And Delegate Jimmy Massey. Good to see you, sir. Thank you for having us, Woody. Uh, economic development is a really critical issue this year, given the budget. Uh, tell us what's going on in terms of economic development. Yeah, thank you, Woody. Look, the U.S. economy has not grown at a rate of 3% or better for 11 years 11 in a row. years. 11 years in a row. The last time that happened was never. It only happened for four years during the Great Depression. The Virginia economy only grew at 2% in 2015. It didn't grow at greater than 1% for the four years prior to that. Uh, that is incredibly poor national and Virginia economic performance, Woody. And a result of that, we got a lot of Virginians that are really, really hurting worried about their families, how they're going to pay their bills, and particularly worried about their kids. So in the House, uh, that is our number one priority, is, that, is restoring economic growth, job growth, and wage growth for as many Virginians as we possibly can. We have a four-point plan to do that. Number one, we are going to balance the budget, the $1.5 billion shortfall that's due to the lack of economic growth without increasing taxes or fees on any Virginians. Number two, uh, you probably have read about how the mess that the Virginia Economic Development Partnership yes. is. We are going to make great progress this year. Chairman Jones is carrying that bill, but I'm working very closely with him on that. And we are going to make major reform efforts and try to get the Virginia Economic Development Partnership headed in the right direction. Number three on our four-point plan is regulatory reform. We have a series of regulatory reform. We're going to try to get the government out of people's lives. Uh, and number four, we've got a set of series of common sense economic wage growth bills like no minimum wage, no, uh, no prevailing wage floor <laughs> stuff. And I think that four-point plan is uh, going to make great strides uh, in, in helping Virginians uh, address their economic angst. And Woody, i got to tell you, we're really looking forward this year to having the debate in Virginia. Riley and I are up for re-election. We're going to have a governor's race, lieutenant governor's race, and attorney general. And we're really looking forward to taking our economic, contrasting our economic growth policies with those of the Democrats and running on those this year in November 2017. Great. Senator Donovan, you sit on the Senate Finance Committee, and you're, you're going to be wrestling with these issues as well. I am indeed. And we, um, you know, I think in the Senate, we're very concerned about making sure that our sheriffs and state police, that our um, state employees and our teachers are also compensated appropriately. So as we work to balance the budget, as we will at the end of this session, we'll, we'll, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that we can get those raises to our employees. We think that that's a really important priority in Virginia and you need to make that clear. Um, of course, I'm on Health and Human Resources right. Subcommittee, and that's always a challenging subcommittee because the needs are so many. We really have to make some forward motion in taking care of mental health issues in the state, and I believe that we'll be making some significant investments there and looking at ways that we can strategize to streamline and improve the dollars that we're spending getting to individuals so that they can have some continuity of care. Concepts that we have in healthcare is you make transitions, say, from jail mm -hmm to a CSB, um, you need to make sure that you maintain medical continuity for those patients or we're in a crisis state constantly. So all of those things will be high priorities for us in education. And uh, Delegate Ingram, uh, state employees are not going to get a raise this year. It creates some critical problems, especially in terms of law enforcement. Just like the senator just mentioned and also uh, Jimmy Massey, we are working diligently trying to see what we can do for the state police, all the state employees, things that really need to be done. They're definitely underpaid. State police, when I was growing up, I remember that in the little city of Hopewell there, the 
the police officers wanted to go to the state police. They wanted to be a state trooper because they paid more money, the retirement was better, everything. Now, what we are as a training ground, Woody, what we're doing is we're spending seventy, eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 training these troopers to be on the road. They're on the road for a year, year and a half, and local government is picking them up, paying them three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 more than what they're making at the state level. This is not the way to run uh, Virginia, and we really need to change that because our state troopers put their lives on the line every, each and every day. Law enforcement is a tough thing. There are two jobs I would not want today. One is a teacher, school teacher. I would not want to be a school teacher. And the other one is a police officer, law enforcement officer, because they, they have a tough job and they do not get paid nowhere near what they should get paid. But the other thing that I just wanted to mention was the health care. Health care is always a big issue, Woody. And um, Emmett Hanger, the Senator Hanger, myself, a co-chair of the uh, health commission, you know, to, to uh, close, you know, the... You training, know, the, the training, right, training centers. centers and gosh that is tough what it is something and we we're still undecided as to exactly what needs to be done and where because it is there are some cases that it is very difficult to the families to that for them to come out of the training center and especially the ones that are really really in really Bad shape. Yeah, we're talking about uh, a settlement reach with the Department of Justice. Just, there's a yes. court order that requires the Commonwealth to do that. That's now. correct. Right. Uh, Delegate Massey, talk to us about how we can diversify even more the economy of Virginia, because as you know, we're still heavily dependent upon the largesse of Washington, D.C. Yeah, well, I mean, that's an incredibly important uh, issue, Woody, and the Virginia Economic Development Partnership, that's kind of one of their primary focuses. And, you know, you saw the JLARC report back in November. I mean, it's just been a mess over there. So, you know, in diversifying Virginia, Woody, we've just got to continue to keep Virginia just the best state. You know, that's the other thing. Virginia, eight or so years ago, used to be the best state to do business. And in that same period of, you know, lack of economic growth, we've gone to 12th or 13th. So we have just got to work to keep our tax rates low, our regulatory environment low, our education system, both K-12 and higher ed, the best. So when we are out doing, so our existing companies will want to grow, and when we're out doing selling Virginia around the country and selling Virginia, really, the Economic Development Partnership sells Virginia around the country, but sells it around the world. So we've got to be a place when, when our economic development partners get in front of decision makers, they say, wow, you know, what a great place to live, work, and raise a family that Virginia is. We want to grow our business there, or we want to go move our business there. So that's uh, what we can be doing, uh, just making Virginia the absolutely best place to do business and raise a family. In, in, in terms of regulatory burdens, especially with reference to taxes, what about that old B-pole tax, the yeah. Business Professional Occupational License Tax? Yeah, yeah. Look, we in the House, we looked really hard this year at, doing, at take, undertaking a significant tax reform package. The problem is when you say tax reform to a Democrat, that means tax increase. Okay? And we're not going there. So we decided not to emphasize tax reform this year, but we would really like to work with a Republican governor this year, a Republican governor candidate, and we would love to be next year focused on a major tax reform package. And one of the things that would be in Jimmy Massey's tax reform package is repealing uh, the B-pole tax, the machinery tools tax, and then the merchant's capital tax. I mean, to tax a B-pole tax, business, business professional occupancy license tax, to tax a business on the top line, on their income, no matter if they make money or not, is just anathema to any business person. It's a disincentive to do business. And if you look at the counties in Virginia, like my county, Henrico doesn't do the B-pole tax. Oh, excuse me, Hen Hanover doesn't do the B-pole tax. Henrico does. You know, it just creates a competitive advantage. So I would, in a, in a major tax reform package that I hope we're working on next year with a Republican governor, where tax reform means reducing marginal tax rates, eliminating regulation, a B poll elimination B poll is going to be really high on my list. And go ahead. What I want to say, let's take the reverse side of that. In the city of Hopewell, which I represent, and I represent him, part of Henrico and Chesterfield and Prince George, it would hurt Prince George a lot, but Hopewell, in the city of Hopewell, 40 some percent, when I was a mayor over there, it was 42 or 44 percent of the total taxes that the city collects is from, from industry. 
And if you take that away, we've got to replace that for local governments. Local governments, in other words, this is the flip side of this, sure. for example. Now, Chesterfield and Racco wouldn't be affected as much as the little city of Hopewell. And, little, and the city of Hopewell is depressed. And uh, when you take up machinery and tools and people, I don't know how we could make up the difference. That's just the reverse side of it. Sounds like a finance committee issue over on the Senate <laughs> side, eventually at least. Well, it, it does, and, and I'm going to take a slightly different, it, it, it's very challenging because that is a local tax. And so it is something that would only be able to be done in a comprehensive tax package, mm -hmm. as Jimmy has alluded to, and would have to, hopefully we'll look at every tax, um, because there are taxes and fees that affect our economy significantly. We really need to get a good handle on what that is and maybe improve transparency about that and see what we can do. As far as economic opportunity is concerned, let me just step aside for one second and go back to the state police. So much of the responsibility for anti-terrorism has moved away from the federal government into the states. And our, our state police force is the state police. And they have amazing ability to serve us. But there is no, nothing more important that the state can do than make sure we're safe. In order to do that, we need to make sure that we have a fully staffed state police. And we don't. So we're going to have to make those adjustments and make sure we do them appropriately because the responsibilities for them are increasing while the pay is decreasing. So I think that's incredibly important. Socioeconomic opportunity to me has a large investment in education and, and population health. And so those are things that I think are pivotal to us having a workforce that can contribute to dealing with the opiate crisis and to looking, if you look at Virginia, we have such diverse health opportunity. That means do you have in place in your area the things that can help make you more likely to live longer, be healthy, have less chronic disease, and be a participating member in society? And if you contrast Northern Virginia to Southwestern Virginia, mm -hmm. it's very concerning. And so we really, I hope that over this next year, we're going to have some opportunities to take a step back and maybe look at Virginia a little bit differently and say, let's not look at how we've done things and how we can make those things better. Let's take a look at what Virginia needs to be in five years from a population health standpoint and how can we get there and what does that mean for how we provide those services. And it may look really different than the way we're designed right now to provide those services. And I think we ought to welcome that challenge. Well, let's continue to take advantage of your exp expertise as a physician. You mentioned opioid. Yes, sir. Uh, th there's a real crisis, not only in the Commonwealth, but nationwide. The migration of those who have been on opioids to heroin. Talk right. to us about that particular problem. So, you know, it is it is very concerning to me as a physician. 75% of addictions start with a prescription. You know, really before the 1980s, we didn't have tablet forms of opiates that you could take home. Uh, there's a lot of data that we're getting at the national level that prescribing should be limited to seven days. And I'll be introducing legislation this year to make sure that we encourage physicians to do so. Every day after seven days that you continue to take opiates, your likelihood of addiction increases. So this, this is no longer only a prescription problem, as you've said. The illegal drugs that are involved in even some of the really concerning synthetic drugs that are coming into the state that have a high death rate because they're so unpredictable in how strong they are. It's a crisis on all fronts. It's a crisis for children. Our foster care numbers have gone up exponentially because there's so many parents that are drug addicted. So we have a lot of new services that have been implemented or are in the process of being implemented through our Medicaid services where for the first time in Virginia, we're really going to have the workforce to deal with drug addiction. We're going to have places that people can go to get that help, and it's going to be adequately funded. So it's not a perfect system, but it's a start, and we need to deal with those that are already addicted. We need to make sure that they get services. We need to make sure we try and stem the tide for others. And I'm sure that's something that afflicts at least some of your constituents as well, Delegate. Oh, yeah. I mean, as Siobhan reiterated, I mean, it is the biggest crisis. Our sheriff in Enrico County, uh, you know, talks about it all the time. You know, he says, he don't, Mike Wade will tell you, he only has two type of people in his jail, those that are on drugs and those that need to be on drugs. And so it is a, this opioid thing is a huge problem. I don't have, I mean, it's really nice to have Siobhan. Uh, mm -hmm. She's my senator, by the way. It's really nice to have Siobhan because she has the medical expertise. I don't have that medical expertise, but we hear about it all the time. And I, I don't know of a family 
that I know that hasn't been affected by, you know, addiction, be it drug addiction, alcohol addiction. It's a, it's a huge problem, Woody, and we're going to, uh, uh, there's a lot of momentum to deal with. It. And of course, educate, educating the public about that and a number of other issues is important. And I know you chair a couple of education subcommittees. Yeah. Talk about the work those subcommittees are doing. Yeah, you know, uh, Woody, I love, uh, used to listen to uh, Whitney Houston sing, and one of the songs she used to sing are the children are our future. And it really is true. You know, after economic growth in the house, we're focused on the kids, both K-12 and higher ed. We have got to have the finest system of K-12 education and the finest system of higher ed for our kids because they are our future. So we are very committed to that in the house. The, the budget, that the new two-year budget that we passed in the last session that became effective on July 1st, there was an almost $900 million two-year increase in K-12 spending, $450 million a year. That was about 8%. That actually only gets us back to a per pupil spending without adjusted for inflation, a slightly above where we were about 10 years ago. So one of the things that we have done, and I think the Senate has uh, agreed with this, is even though we've got some a billion and a half dollar shortfall, we got hands off on K-12. So we're going to protect that. Uh, the teacher pay raises dropped out, but that's only about a one percent. Uh, decline. So we were up about 8% in the, in, the, in the new two-year budget. When the teacher pay raises went out, that was about one, one and a half. So we're still up, uh, you know, six and a half or so. And I would tell you also that we have 135, on the teacher pay raise issue, we have 135 school divisions in the state of Virginia. Only 12 of them did not give the teachers a pay raise anyway. Mm -hmm. So the localities like ours in RICO mm -hmm. gave their teachers a 2.5% pay raise like they did all their employees. So the teachers, uh, most all the teachers in the state did get a pay raise, but we're going to be focused, as Siobhan and Riley have talked about, on our state police. And we're going to also be focused on is there anything we can do for our state employees in the budget. Now, you're going to hear Chairman Jones tomorrow. Uh, he's going to stand up on the House floor tomorrow and talk about our priorities in the House. And so you'll hear some more information about what we're specifically proposing to do. And we're in close concert with our friends in the Senate. Uh, so you'll hear Chairman Jones, I think, lay out tomorrow in broad terms what we're going to, our priorities are going to be. But education, K-12, and higher ed are going to be high on the list. Hey, Riley, how are your school districts faring? Well, here's, here's another thing, Woody, to back up on what uh, Jimmy was just saying. What we're looking at, when we haven't gotten there yet, but we're looking at the possibility of trying to give a pot of money possibly to the school divisions across the state and let them decide what to do with that yeah, money. In other words, we here in Richmond do not know what is best, say, for Henrico County yeah. or the county of Prince George or in Northern Virginia, it may be another need. So if that's the case, then the school board would be able to to decide where the best to use that money. I, I personally think it would be a, a real good idea. I think it would take uh, the money and put it where they feel like the need is because some of the needs that we may have may not be what they really need. Can I comment on that? Sure, right? absolutely. So absolutely. I'm chairman of the K-12 Subcommittee yes. of Appropriations through which six and a half billion dollars, it's the largest line item in the state budget. And Riley's actually saying, tooting my own horn for me over here because yeah. we did Get, we, we upped the governor's recommendations last year by um, about $90 million for the local school division. But what Riley just referred to, and I, I led that effort, and I just, I, it was to uh, give the localities more lottery funds. And so right. lottery right. funds, they don't have to come up with the local match. Right. And it also gives them the flexibility. So we, we want, in, in concert again, in, in partnership with our Senate, we won up the governor by about a little less than $100 million for the K-12 this past budget. And we gave them more flexibility because Riley's exactly right. What the money needs to be spent on in Henrico, where Siobhan and I care about, what the money needs to be spent on in Hopewell, two different things. With the in Lunenburg County or in the far southwest or in northern Virginia, they just different school systems. They had different needs. Those local school boards in the best position to decide how to spend that money. And we gave them that. We gave them more money and we gave them more flexibility. And I got to tell you, they were really, really, as I went around the state this year, they were very, very appreciative of that. So, Senator, discretion at the local school level in terms of how they use their funds is critical. I think it's critical. I think we need to trust our partners in, in taking care of the, the citizens of the Commonwealth and local government knows best what they need. So there are things that we need to direct 
and accountability that we need to hold, but at the same time, I think we can trust the localities to make good decisions. Not all localities are equal in opportunity, and that affects education too. And so some of the things you're going to see this session, one will be a lively discussion about virtual education. There are a lot of different opinions about how to approach that. I really think that we need subject matter experts on IT and on virtual education that will be developing the programs because there's a disparity between high quality programs and not. And kids learn in different ways. We, as much as we are investing in our schools, we still have a lot of challenges in kids actually doing anything with that investment. And so we need to look at it a little bit differently and one of those things is not only to hold schools accountable, but it's also to give children opportunities to learn different ways. And we know that children, there there are some children who learn better through virtual education and there are some school systems that don't even have math teachers. And so having a robust virtual education opportunity for our students in K-12 is going to make a big difference. Cost of education is important too. The higher your level of education that you go, high school degree, secondary degrees, any, any additional level you achieve contributes to your long-term health less chronic disease, longer life, better health in general. So all of these things are intertwined and interrelated. So what are, where are we on getting kids from high school to a degree, a certificate, a licensure, or a four-year degree? You've heard a lot of talk about stackable credits, and we talk about mm -hmm. that with credentials and licensures. I'm offering a stackable credit concept for our four-year colleges that would make us unique in the country, and that's something I'm calling passport credits. So right now, if your child gets a general education credit at a community college, it may or may not count for that mm -hmm. gen ed program at a four-year school. That then parents pay twice for the same set mm -hmm. of credits and kids are in school longer and they're discouraged and demoralized. This passport program would ask the four-year schools to get together and come up with a consensus of what our gen ed credits ought to look like. And those are the same classes that we'll be teaching across the board in our two-year colleges. And then when a child goes, if they get accepted to a variety of four schools, they have no doubt that that gen ed credit that they've paid for and they've taken is good and they can move on and take the next level of advancement and get through school a little bit more quickly and a little bit less expensively. This will be great, too, when we're able to go back and really spend some time on our dual enrollment programs in high school. I have a daughter that went to the engineering program in Henrico County, an amazing program that was dual enrollment with VCU School of Engineering. She graduated with 28 college credits. Almost none of them were accepted by her school for anything other than an elective. So when a parent is investing and a school system is investing in dual enrollment credits in high school, it would be nice to know that those are actually going to count towards college. And, and by giving out a label of passport, we'll encourage the, the K-12 school systems to pull passport credits into their programs. Mm -hmm. And then you know you actually have a stackable credit that you can use to get through school faster. And there's no reason our kids can't be using their senior year to start college. You talked about, go ahead. Yeah, can I comment on that? Absolutely. I mean, there is a fundamental difference of opinion between Republicans and Democrats over school choice, uh, which uh, Javon's referring to. Uh, we believe, Jimmy Massey believes, and I think Siobhan and, and Riley also believe, that parents are in the best position to decide what's the best education environment for their kids. So we want to provide them with every value-added choice. We want to have the best public schools. We want to let them home school. We want to let them send them to charter school. We want to let them send them to virtual school. We want to be able to send them to a non-public school. We want to be able to do combinations of all of those things. But there is a fundamental difference of opinion between Republicans and Democrats on that. So we will be this year sending the governor again virtual school legislation. I think Dickie Bell's bill, education savings account from Dave LaRock. Uh, and me, and me. And, I and, and uh, ah, okay, <laughs> okay, wonderful. I, I, didn't, I wasn't aware of that. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and then Tebow Bill, uh, right. uh, expanding my education improvement scholarship tax credit program. I think we, you know, we believe in empowering parents and letting them make the decision. I expect the governor to veto all those. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to take that to the people of Virginia again, along with our economic growth package and our education package, and say, what do you want, Virginians, as we go into this election in November 18? But there is, Woody, a fundamental difference of opinion. Uh, the Democrats believe that your zip code, where you live, should decide where you go to school. We believe that your parents, who know you best, should decide where you go to school. We want to provide them with all those options. And 
We want to provide them with the money that goes with it so they can pay for it. And I'll just mention the Department of Health has some really interesting information about zip codes. And the zip code you're born into has a significant determination mm -hmm. on what your mm -hmm. health is going to be like for the rest of your life. And really this, this, this discussion about school choice, somebody must take responsibility ultimately for every child in the Commonwealth. And with the best intentions, the school system are not the person that has the most investment in that child. It is the parent. And the parent needs to be able to have the say about what they believe is best for that child. We won't all agree, but that's the diversity that makes us great. And, uh, and, go you ahead. Know, and would it, things have changed a great deal. I'm 75 years old, and when I was in school, you know, my mother used to sit down at night and help me, and, you know, she'd correct my work, and I would do the homework. But today, and, and it's, it's no one person that you can blame, but real quick, let me just give you an example. Um, this gentleman that, that is one of the officers like over at, at uh, one of the schools, this kid, he put this kid, kid was only like one, you know, first grade. And he was kicking and screaming, didn't want to go get on the bus. So he put him on the bus, the bus driver shuts the door. And when the bus comes back, the bus driver said, the kid's still on the bus. He said, what? He said, it was no one there at the house mm -hmm. to, to, so that we couldn't leave him there with the empty house. There was nobody to get him. This does happen. And, and the thing of it is, is, is they went back and this was, um, you know, and, you know, drugs, you know, mm -hmm. in the house and things like this. These are things that, how do you solve these problems? I don't know, but things have changed a great deal. Our, our school systems, our police departments, we didn't used to have the riots that we have today. And everybody has the right to protest, but wouldn't no one has the right to destroy property. Burn limousines, burn cars, break out windshields, break out uh, windows, break in Starbucks and all. Nobody has that right. In other words, we need to get a handle on what we're doing and just everybody has the old saying, can't we all just get along? We got about a minute left. I wanted to give, give you the opportunity to talk about some legislation you have pending regarding telemedicine. So telemedicine is, you know, medicine's amazing because it is technology that helps the body heal. The body is amazingly capable of healing itself. But telemedicine is one of those new technologies that allows us to extend the workforce of physicians and other providers to people who don't have access to medicine. We have some legislation going through this year to smooth over and reconcile conflicts between federal and state regs so that we can make sure we get that care, especially to the Southwest, especially to the, S the, the CSBs, to start treatment for people that are having addiction problems. Great. Well, thank you all for being here, Jimmy Massey, Siobhan Donovan, and Riley Ingram. Thank you, Thank you, Woody. You, Woody. Thank you for watching Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and Comcast. Until next time, I am Woody Evans.